Welcome to the Graphics Get Drawn In panel. Stories that inspire, characters that connect, art that comes alive. Meet the authors of some of the hottest upcoming graphic novels for kids. These are the stories that ignite their imaginations, spark creativity, and encourage reading while engaging them in new and exciting ways. I'm Raina Telgemeier, author and illustrator of Smile, Sisters, and Guts. I'm joined today by Katherine Applegate, Michael Grant, Chris Grine, Barry and Johnson, Shannon Wright, and Tom Engelberger. Welcome, panelists. Barry and Johnson is the author of several novels for children and young adults, including The Parker Inheritance, for which he won a Coretta Scott King Honor Award, The Great Green Heist, and To Catch a Cheat. His upcoming book, Twins, is his first graphic novel. Shannon Wright is an illustrator and cartoonist whose work has appeared in The Guardian, Time, The New York Times, NPR, and Google. She is the illustrator of Twins, which is available on October 6th. Thanks so much, Raina. Hi, I'm Varian Johnson, the author of Twins. And I'm Shannon Wright, the illustrator of Twins. And we're so happy to be published by Scholastic and share our debut graphic novel with everyone. So Twins is about, well, twins. Uh, Growing up, twin sisters Maureen and Francine were always a pair. They shared all the same classes and activities and even dressed alike. Maureen, the younger of the two, loved it. Then comes middle school and everything changes. Francine starts dressing differently. She joins new clubs, goes by a shortened name, Fran. And worst of all, Maureen and her sister are placed in separate classes. Maureen thinks that it's that a mistake, some computer fluke that created the different schedules. But then she quickly discovers that it's not a mistake, that it's not a fluke. Her sister asked for them to be separated. So I've written a bunch of prose novels, but I don't think I've ever written anything quite as autobiographical as Twins. You see, just like Maureen and Francine, I'm a twin, five minutes younger than my identical twin brother. And like the girls, my brother and I shared all the same classes, uh, that is until middle school. But the book was inspired by other things, other people as well, particularly these two stinkers. These are my daughters. My kiddos, especially my oldest, loves graphic novels. She devours them or, or like inhales them. It actually irks me a little bit just how quickly she reads them. I'm like, kid, do you know how long it took to make that book? Slow down. All joking aside, graphic novels are what transform my daughter from a reluctant reader into a voracious reader. However, as much as she loves graphic novels, we struggle to find comics that featured black girls like her. We struggle to find graphic novels where she could see herself on the page. And this is how twins morph from being a book for me into being a book for all readers. Black kids deserve to see themselves the stars of the story. And it's just as important for other readers to see black kids as the main characters, as the stars of the story as well. Paraphrasing Dr. Rudine Smith Bishop, books can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, and hopefully twins will be able to serve readers in all three of these ways. Out of the two girls, I'm probably more like Maureen, the younger of the twins. She's bookish and very introverted, very much like me when I was younger. And like Maureen, I struggled with how to become my own individual self when my brother and I were put in separate classes in middle school. And fun fact, like Maureen, I was placed, against my wishes, in junior Air Force ROTC which is similar to the Youth Cadet Corps class in Twins. So uh, for any of you guys out there who's thinking about writing a graphic novel, let me warn you now, it is an entirely new and different way of thinking. As a novelist, when I'm thinking about pacing, I'm often weighing the length of each chapter, paragraph, or sentence. But with graphic novels, I found that I also have to think about pacing in terms of the number of panels per page, and in some cases, even the size of those panels. I had to think about page turns, how to maximize the strength of Shannon's illustrations while also minimizing the amount of dialogue and narration. I even had to think about character placement, staging, basically, you know, who's sitting beside who. I had to consider what action is happening on the page when the character is giving narration. Trust me, none of this stuff is easy. I also discovered that working on a graphic novel was more of a partnership, certainly more so than any of my previous novels. Sure, 
it was my job to come up with the script, but I didn't write it in a vacuum. In addition to my editors, Shannon reviewed the script at each stage. And her comments weren't limited to just the art. Shannon and I talked through the dialogue and the characterization, really all parts of the book. Also, my editors and I felt that it was important to not only create a book with Black characters, but to also have a co-creator who was Black. If we are really committed to diversity and inclusion, we need to make sure that all aspects of our work are diverse, not just the characters on the page, but also the people behind the book. Plus, I wanted, I needed a partner who got what it meant to be a Black girl. Someone who understood that Black kids come in all shades and shapes and sizes. Someone who understood all the wonderful ways in which you can style our hair. Someone who understood Black families and Black love. And with that, I am so thrilled to say I found that partner in Shannon Wright. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shannon, my partner and the illustrator of Twins. Thank you, Varian. Um, as was mentioned earlier, Varian and I partnered up for Twins to try and create something special, something genuine. Um, and it was important that that diversity not only took place on the page, but behind the scenes too. So when it came to creating Marine and Francine, it felt so natural because in them, I saw myself. Um, and not only myself, I saw my cousins and my family members. I saw some of my classmates. And it felt like I was looking in that mirror and actually seeing my younger self for the first time in comics. In Francine, for instance, I saw a lot of myself um, in both physical appearance and also personality. She's outgoing, she's super involved, but also very subconscious about herself and also her abilities. When initially designing the girls, I wanted to make sure that their individual personalities really shine through despite them being identical twins. Because at the end of the day, they are very much their own person and they're not interchangeable. So I took reference from my own life and all the black kids that I had ever interacted with, but I also took reference from real life, from black siblings who were identical but very much still their own person. And it didn't stop there. Vera and I worked very closely together to create a world for our characters to exist in. And that included families and friends, their community. There's Nikki, there's Tasha, there's Monique, there's Amber, there's Richard. Um, they're all equally important to the story and reflect so many children um, and individuals who oftentimes get left out of the narrative. So many kids and students who don't get to be the stars or the protagonists of these stories. Students like the ones who made my first career day and so many more, so very special. Mirrors, windows, sliding doors, that's what we hope twins will be for someone, whether they're a kid or an adult. Now, in terms of illustrating the book, it was very tedious. Again, like, like Barry mentioned, graphic novels are a lot of hard work that force you to approach writing and sequential images in a whole different way. You have the script, you have thumbnails, you have pencils, you have letters, you have inks, flats, I could go on and on and on, on top of editing. And if you're working with someone, it's a partnership, a true collaboration, and graphic novels should be acknowledged as such. They are a marathon, not a sprint, believe me. And as partners, we trusted one another to put in the time to do the research to make this world very much alive and lived in, such as captivating the feeling of your first day at school or that feeling of being at the mall or in the food court or a loud buzzing class, um, classroom or lunchroom with a bunch of students or a dispute with your best friend. Twins is a love letter to Black families, much like my own, and to the communities that raise, shape, and change us. But for me, Twins is also and ultimately a love letter to this little girl who hadn't been able to put down her drawing pencil since she was like four years old. 
a little girl who also devoured books, but could see she wasn't the star in hardly any of them. And in creating twins, I thought about a little girl who had a tool and wanted to change that. I always cry, like, when the, uh, I hear you talk about this. <laughs> and you think I would stop right now, right? Um, yeah. But uh, I, I'm so glad that you're excited for Twins I Am Too. And all you guys out there, um, please keep a lookout for the book. It comes out October 6, 2020 from Scholastic Graphics. Thanks so much. Catherine Applegate is the co-author of the best-selling Animorph series, as well as the Revenants and Everworld series and the Newbery Award winning The One and Only Ivan. Michael Grant is the other co-author of the Animorph series. He has also written the Frontline series, Gone series, Messenger of Fear series, and the Magnificent Twelve series. Welcome, Catherine and Michael. So I'm Catherine Applegate and Michael Grant. And we are collectively K.A. Applegate. The uh, symbiotic life form known as K.A. Applegate. <laughs> A.K.A. K.A. Um, and uh, we wrote Animorphs a very, very, very long time ago. Um, hello. 24 years, give or take, since we, when we started, I think. It was, came out first in 1996. We'd have been writing it in 1995, I guess. So we were significantly younger yeah. and uh, very excited because it was our first big series. I still thought I was going to keep my hair. <laughs> yeah. That's how long ago it was. I knew that was a lost cause. <laughs> I know. So uh, in a moment of desperation, not thinking about marketing, which is unusual for me, I said, uh, hey, just, okay, forget everything else. What would you like to write? What would be fun for you to write? And I have always had this thing about animals. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a vet. Um, and so I right away said, I would love to be able to put kids into the heads of animals, but in some very real, you know, visceral way. And I immediately thought, well, that's obviously a sci-fi concept, mm -hmm. and we're going to need some aliens. So <laughs> we, we brought the aliens, and then pretty soon we had an idea. And basically, we put it together as a series Bible um, and sent a couple of sample chapters off and boom, Scholastic bought it. That was pretty amazing. And we ended up, this was during the, the time, and, and you don't see this anymore, where a book a month was coming out. There was Goosebumps. We, oh, we so wanted to be like Goosebumps. And Ann Martin's amazing series, Babysitter's Club, and they were coming out every single month. This meant we had to write a book every single month. Uh, this meant a lot of coffee was consumed, especially after we had our first child. Yeah, that kind of put a crimp in things. I remember working on chapters, though, uh, sitting on a laptop in a darkened waiting room outside the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. But you were inside, you know, breastfeeding or something. Um, and I would sit out there and typey, typey, typey at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah, that made yeah, it more complicated. It was but, hard. It was hard. But um, and, and eventually we ended up, um, we, how many books? 64 in the series? 63? Well, 54 in the regular series. And then I can never remember. I, I think it's 10 more. Yeah. Or maybe right, nine I more. I, so, or maybe just eight more that we did and then two alternomorphs, which we didn't do. Yeah. Uh, our brilliant editor, I believe, took care of that. That was Tanya Alicia Martin. Oh, uh, she was the, amazing. The un unsung hero of, of Animorphs, Oh, absolutely. By the way. Um, and, um, and, of course, Jean Fiwa. And, of course, Jean uh, our publisher. Um, so we uh, we struggled along. We wrote we wrote most of them. Eventually, we used some ghost writers who were amazing too. Um, one of the things I thought that really uh, struck a chord with uh, young readers were Dave Mattingly's uh, amazing covers. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, they they just you they know, popped the off the shelves. No question. And they had these flip pages. Uh, which I understand librarians hated because, of course, it destroyed That's the books. Books. But, you know, it, that, that was a really cool feature. So they just kind of evolved, and they started out, you know, middle grade, and then they went kind of kind of dark on us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. They were kind of dark on us. Um, a lot of that was, uh, you know, of course, deliberate. We Look, we... Let me put it this way. At the time, we were getting no feedback from readers because we were too busy. We were putting out the 12 to 14 books a year and still doing other work as well. And um, so we didn't, and email hadn't been invented yet. The computer was barely there, honest to God. We had to drive like no. Flintstone cars, you know. 
Uh, it's bad times. Yeah. And um, it never occurred to us really at some level that anybody's paying attention. We didn't really know. So then we started hearing from fans uh, years and years later. Uh, and then they were grown up. And so they were getting letters from people and going, oh, you know, I built my entire life around this. Here's my Animorphs tattoo. I named my kid after one of the characters. And we're like, wow. Um, yeah. We were kind of surprised. <laughs> and, you know, it's such a cliche word to throw in there, but it was, it was humbling. Because you wow. thought, oh, we had this effect without necessarily intending. It's all been, it's been very yeah, gratifying, cool. I would say, kind of humbling and kind of you know, strange at some level, because yeah. we're not people who like to take ourselves seriously. Um, and that, and, and by the way, and, and I want to conclude, I think, by, uh, by saying that, uh, as I said, the graphic novel, we didn't do that work. That's Chris. That's Chris's it's work. It's all Chris okay. Prime. Yeah. So he gets, he gets all the credit. He's done a great job. Uh, we contributed nothing but the original idea and 100% of whatever credit there is uh, goes to him for that. Oh, that's absolutely true. He's. Uh, we're just so thrilled to be part of the Scholastic Graphics imprint and to have Chris doing this. I mean, he, he's done all the heavy lifting. He's brought it to life and um, it was a it was a big job. So we are eternally grateful to him. Yeah, we like jobs where we don't have to actually work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, thank you, Chris. You're amazing. Chris Grind's graphic novels include Time Shifters and Chicken Hair, which was nominated for an Eisner Award. His latest is the graphic novel adaptation of The Animorphs, which will be available on October 6th. Hi, my name is Chris Grind. I've been making comics uh, professionally since 2005. And uh, growing up, so when Animorphs came out, uh, in around 1996, I had just started college, so it was kind of off my radar at the time. Although it was, I mean, any you could go to any bookstore anywhere you went, and you'd see the uh, those covers, those iconic covers, and whether or not you'd read them, or, um, if it, whether or not you'd read them or not, there was something about those covers that kind of st stuck with you, and you could remember them. And they, I know they've become, you know, popular memes and uh, stuff online, social media for years now, and. Uh, and then, you know, uh, post-college, when I'd had an opportunity to read some of them, I became an instant fan of them. Uh, the characters are so well, you know, they're so fleshed out and they're so fun and the villains are so great. Uh, I think one of my favorite characters in all the Animorphs books is uh, the main villain of Visser 3, who is ridiculous. He has a ridiculous amount of unearned confidence, and I just love that. He's just so serious all the time, but things just don't ever really seem to work out for him very well but anyway so when i had the opportunity to uh adapt these books into graphic novels i i jumped at it right away and it's it's just been so amazing so once this project was announced uh right after the first of the year i was i was kind of bombarded um on social media with uh private messages and just people reaching out in general on twitter and wanting to know you know how i was going to be adapting them am i going to stay true to the books what could i what was i going to be changing what was i allowed to change uh, and I, I didn't really have, I kind of had an idea what I wanted to do, but I didn't really know exactly what the rules were going to be just yet. Um, when I first started this, but luckily Scholastic was very good about it. I mean, they didn't really push back. My biggest fear at the time was that I wanted to stay as true to the books as possible because I know that's, you know, the fans grew up with these and, you know, they wanted to be as true to them as well. So after I had done like the initial sketches for the whole book, uh, it was like 230 pages. And I was, I was a little concerned that Scholastic may be concerned about the page count, uh, the length of the book, but in which case I would have maybe have had to try to cut some scenes out or cut something uh, out. And luckily they were completely okay with it and it was great. So uh, the, the answer to that is that I, I was almost at a straight adaptation of the book and it's been, it's been really fun to do. There was a few changes I did make, uh, just uh, ver in some of the dialogue, they were uh, more pop culture references that are very outdated now. I mean, it's been a long time uh, since, since those books came out. So I didn't really remove the reference as much as I just kind of, I kind of made it a little bit more generic. Uh, so it kind of applied to a lot of things that were going on. So it wasn't specific to any one particular TV show or a movie. I tried to make it as uh, as generic as possible without would still being interesting and not not killing the joke or the conversation or whatever because I just I see like my kids 
reading it. I have a 12 year old daughter who would absolutely not know who David Letterman is and things like that. So I wanted her to still understand the joke and get the joke, but I needed to put it in a way that I felt like the younger generation would, would still understand it and still get the impact of what was being said. Um, and then, and then one of the scenes that I did change, uh, and I didn't really change it too much. I just had to kind of combine it. So there's a scene and I, there's some minor spoilers here. So if you haven't read the books and you want to stay completely um, spoiler free, then maybe turn off the volume for just a minute. But there's a scene where uh, one of the characters turns into a lizard at school to, so he can spy on a particular person in the school. And uh, in the book, I get, it was much easier because, you know, he's running around, he's having, he's thinking about all these things that he's seen and experiences that he's having. And there's people walking around that are like giants to him but it seemed weird to me on the page to just have a lizard running around school with a bunch of word balloons that were like thought bubbles the whole time. So I just kind of adapted that scene to where it's kind of being narrated uh, by that character as if it's already happened. It just kind of transitions right into a scene that also, I mean, this is where one of my favorite scenes that I actually added some of my own uh, humor to it just a little bit because that particular kid had also eaten while he was a lizard, ate a live spider completely on accident, which was very disgusting in the book. And so uh, I, from that point on, I have him like constantly just shoving nachos in his mouth and eating and trying to get that taste out of his mouth. And he doesn't want to talk about it. Um, so I added a little bit of humor, some of my own type of humor into it, but I didn't really change anything fundamentally about the story or the characters or anything that's happening. Cause I just didn't, there was no reason to, cause um, it's a very strong story and I wasn't getting any, I wasn't getting any notes to, you know, keep it under a certain page number or anything like that. So it was really good. Um, I was really happy with uh, all the collaboration that I did with Scholastic and graphics. And it was, I think you guys are going to be really happy with it. Tom Engelberger is the author of the New York Times, USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling Star Wars Origami Yoda series, as well as Marvel's Rocket and Groot series. His latest graphic novel, Geronimo Stilton, The Sewer Rat Stink, is available now. Oh, thank you so much, Raina. It's so exciting to be introduced by you. I had the pleasure of uh, hosting a panel with you one time, so I thank you for returning the favor. I've had such a great time finally getting to write a graphic novel. It's been my dream uh, since before the term graphic novel was popular. Back then, I just wanted to write comic books been my dream for decades. It's taken a long time, but I finally got there. I am adapting the Geronimo Stilton book, The Sewer Rat Stink. I took this crazy book about mice in the sewers underneath New Mouth City, and I made a graphic novel out of it. Uh, what's really great is that I was already a big fan of Geronimo Stilton, and I know kids all over the world are big fans of Geronimo Stilton. So it was a great opportunity for me to uh, do my thing. But uh, the question is, what exactly is my thing? Uh, I don't draw as well as the people that were already drawing Geronimo Stilton. So how was I gonna do this? Well, when I uh, got the job, I realized, uh, well, actually even to try out for the job, I had to learn how to draw Geronimo Stilton. And there was no way I was gonna draw him as well as the people that were already drawing him. So I came up with a system and I'd like to show you now. And if you, um, if you wanna try it out, it might work for you too. So what I do is I first I figure out where on the page I'm gonna be drawing Geronimo. I draw a big line down for him. Then I draw another line down here and I draw a snout like that. I give him a nose. And he's got, uh, as you know, Geronimo has little uh, glasses. And I give him two big ears. Down here, this becomes his suit. See, Geronimo is not a superhero or something. Geronimo is a, a little mouse dude that walks around New Mouse City in a very nice green suit. And a tie. So I had to, I had to draw the tie in there, too. And he's got a little vest. So there you go. I'm already, uh, I'm already getting there. I draw the sleeves of his suit coat and his lapels. I give him some little paws. I'm almost done with this picture. Uh, now I just need to figure out what kind of expression Geronimo is. That's what makes Geronimo so much fun to draw. He is full of life. On one page, he'll be going like, bah! 
because he's scared by something. On the next page, he'll be completely happy again. And then he'll fall down a manhole into the sewer and go, ah! And then on the next page, he'll find something to make him happy again. It's amazing the wide range of expressions this mouse has. I've had so much fun drawing it. For you guys today, I think he's happy to see you guys. So I'm just going to give him a nice, happy expression. Like that. Is he looking pretty happy? Don't worry, something terrible will happen to him in just a minute and he'll be grossed out or disgusted. Um, I know he's going to have a lot of fun. He's such a great character. The creator of Geronimo, Elisabetta Dami, who lives in Italy, uh, she let me have so much fun with her creation. And uh, I've gotten to do that before. I've gotten to have fun with Yoda from Star Wars with Rockin' and Groot from Marvel. And now I'm taking on this new character and it's a blast. So thank you very much to Scholastic Graphics for letting me have this much fun. Thank you so much, Tom, that was awesome. So I have a couple of questions for the panelists. Um, the first one is, what books or comics did you love when you were growing up? I can take it. So I actually read more like manga growing up. Um, and it kind of comes through with twins. I put a lot of like anime references in there. Um, but I, I liked reading Dragon Ball. I liked Naruto. <laughs> I liked, I, I just liked consuming manga and anime. And then I would also read um, whatever my dad had because he was a huge like Marvel fan. So he just had stacks of just comic books. So I just read whatever was around or whatever I could find at Borders and I would just sit down and read it at Borders. <laughs> For me, I, um, my friend Kevin Cooper, I'm gonna name drop him because he'll love it. Um, when I was in high school, he turned me on to X-Men, specifically the Dark Phoenix Saga. And I had never read anything like that before with the art and the storytelling and how complex the characters were. And at that point, I just became a lifelong comic book fan. I'm kind of the outlier here, I think. Um, I wasn't much of a reader growing up. And I, I know, I, whenever I go to a conference and admit that, I get gasped. But it just, you know, it took me a while to, to see what all the fun was all about. So I, um, when I did read, it was mostly animal books, I guess not surprisingly, given the kind of focus I have, you know, the E.B. Whites and Call of the Wild kind of thing. I'm old enough that I was actually around when Spider-Man first came out <laughs> and I was living in France, my dad's uh, army, and we were stationed in France at the time. And I had the same attraction to it that everybody has with uh, Marvel Comics, which is that there were, suddenly there were characters. I don't think I thought of it in those terms at that point. Um, wasn't very sophisticated thinker at age, whatever it was, eight. But um, yeah, it was the Spider-Man and of course, um, you know, the Avengers obviously and X-Men. Eventually, you know, later on, Fantastic Four. Don't hold the movies against them. The comics were fine. Um, so I read a fair amount of that at that point, yeah. You know, uh, I'm a Fantastic Four fan, too. Uh, I love Fantastic Four. That was it for me. I refused to read anything else for a long time, unless it was also involved the thing. Um, but, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about what really got me started and wanting to draw comics. And... Um, I don't know if you can see this, but these are these little books that Will Eisner used to put out, but not his adult books uh, and not his serious stuff. Most ridiculous gag cartoons imaginable. This one is called Spaced Out Jokes. I have another one called 101 Space Jokes. And one of them is called Star Jaws because Star Wars and Jaws were both popular at the same time. So he <laughs> put them together. Uh, <laughs> I, one of my teachers had these in their, on their bookshelf in the fourth grade, Scholastic, uh, from, I think they got them from the Scholastic Book Flyer. And uh, I opened it up and that's what really got me started. I became obsessed with drawing giant space amoebas after I read this. <laughs> uh, for me, it was, uh, I mean, I grew up reading comic books a little bit, but I wasn't that into comics. Um, I, I, it may have just been that I wasn't that exposed to them earlier on. And, uh, you know, probably about middle school, I kind of got into some of the Marvel uh, stuff just because my, my friends had those and those were easy for me to get. And I really liked the sequential art and I was really into that, but it wasn't until 
high school when I kind of was introduced to Jeff Smith's Bone and a couple other uh, comic series called The Tick and a couple of things that were either parodies of superheroes or just funny or completely different things like like Bone that is when I it really kind of captured my imagination and I was like I can make I can make stories you know, that I want because I don't necessarily I love superhero stories but I don't really want to make superhero stories so that was for me it was it was it was that kind of thing it was the uh, more alternative stuff at the time it was more it was considered more alternative to not do superhero stuff so that was the stuff that really got me into uh, wanting to do this thank you that was awesome you guys another question is this is a tough one what's the most challenging aspect of making graphic novels uh, we'll speak to that. Uh, it's uh, it's surprisingly easy when you don't do any of the work. <laughs> when you just your written books, and then somebody else comes along and does literally all the work. Uh, so for us, it's been a breeze. <laughs> we defer entirely to Chris Grine on this. <laughs> uh, well, I, then I'll jump in here and say, uh, for me, the hardest part is uh, remembering to stay healthy, because mm -hmm. I work every day of the week. Um, mm -hmm usually from about 8 a.m. till about four um, every day, Monday through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and I, I have to force myself to remember, go take a walk. Don't eat all the fast food all the time, you know, just, just move around. And, and it's good having kids because they, they remind me that I have to go outside and play. That's why I only work till about four. Then we have we usually have dinner and then we go outside and we do stuff. Um, but yeah, for me, the hardest part is just remembering to take care of myself because it's easy for me to neglect myself and make sure that the kids are being taken care of and make sure the job's getting done. And then at the end of the day, I'm like, right, I didn't, I didn't move at all today. So that was bad. Um, so uh, for me, yeah, it's just, it's just mental health and trying to stay as healthy as I can, trying to be active. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm in the same boat as Chris. Um, that would be the hardest part, just like, force myself to like remember to eat did I drink water did I stretch my wrist did I did I breathe fresh air today um exactly I would say yeah I would say that would be the hardest part and then just personally for me um coloring um I like coloring and it's like very apparent in my website everyone's like oh my god your colors are amazing and I'm like oh my gosh guys you have no idea it's like pulling <laughs> teeth I love it but uh it just takes a long time to get there. So yeah, I would say like mental health, like my physical health, just like, you know, making sure I'm taking care of myself and then coloring would be me. Comics take a long time to make. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, I agree with Shannon. I think coloring is the hardest part. Whenever I try to color my own comics, it's a disaster and I, I can only <laughs> think of a couple of colors I am like I've run out of colors and I've only done half of it so thankfully I've got an incredible colorist named Corey Barba who colored mine and so I didn't have to worry about any of that it has been a huge relief because that is so hard the only thing harder maybe is lettering and uh, <laughs> I have an incredible letterer named Shivana so uh, I've just been so lucky i in fact, I'm not even sure what I do. They did all the hard stuff. <laughs> My job as a writer is way easier than anybody actually doing uh, the actual cartooning, the drawing on the graphic novel. But um, it is a partnership, right? And it was really tough for me to let go. I'm used to my novels having them and holding them and hoarding them and like getting everything just the way I want it and like being very adamant sometimes when I really wanted something there. And here you really got to learn to let things go and to trust your partner and to understand where they're coming from and why um, changing up a scene or, or character or dialogue um, or even a sequence makes sense. Um, and once I got it, it was fine. But boy, those first few times were very hard. Great. And my final question, do you guys have a short message of encouragement that you'd like to share with our readers that are watching today? Well, I'll start. I would like to offer a blanket apology for uh, my entire generation because um, we've obviously screwed a lot up. But every time I do an event, I, I meet young people and I am always wildly optimistic by the time I'm done. I feel so encouraged and I know they're going to fix it all. Oh, that was it. No, I, I, I don't do messages of hope. <laughs> 
I do dark and depressing and violent. <laughs> if you need something along those lines, I'm your guy. But otherwise, <laughs> the rest of the world seems so awesome by comparison, right? <laughs> Well, you know, it's a it's a hard time right now. It's a hard time for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I do want to encourage everyone out there to keep pushing for your truth, right? Keep pushing to be seen and to be heard. And and like Catherine said, young people can save the world. I think many my generation and generations before have really screwed things up, but. Uh, you guys can save the world, like literally save the world. And I'm amazed by that every time I do school visits and I talk to young readers and they hear what they're thinking and just how much they understand of what is right and wrong and how impassioned they are to try to fix things. So please don't be deterred by anyone saying that you're too young or you have to wait. Um, be bold and be brave. I mean, do do fix the things that we have been able, unable to fix. That's what I would say. Well, since I'm kind of the generation that uh, everything has kind of fallen onto. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no pressure, Shannon. <laughs> um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would tell um, like my little message of hope is like, obviously like try to take care of yourself and find those pockets of joy because um, they are really hard to find, especially during these times. And I would say like um give yourself like a pat on the back for making it uh one day and then the next day and the day after that um even just like the next hour or the next minute um because it's hard it's um it's it's definitely hard when you're dealing with like your mental health too um so my message would just be like try to find those pockets of joy um and try to share it um and just be genuine, be yourself. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to live in a timeline right now where people are being um, their genuine selves. And I have met so many people who have made my life better and I hope I've made their lives better. And I couldn't imagine not um, having them around and I want them to stay around. And I hope, I hope you guys stay around and uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not trying to get too emotional, but I hope, I hope you guys stick around and just, yeah. So <laughs> before I start crying. I mean, I kind of agree with that. There's, it seems like there's just a lot of bad going on these days. You, you hear about, that's pretty much all you hear about, but there's a lot of good to be found if you're looking for it. And when you do find it, you need to hold on to it and you need to share it and you just need to try to not get so pulled down with all the the negativity that's going on because there's so much good stuff happening yeah if you can find uh if you can find that thing that brings you joy like they're talking about that's okay uh it's okay when you find that and it's okay to love it and i think everybody that's here we're examples we we found these things that we loved and we held on to them and now all these years later, it's my job to share that love with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that's what's great about Comic-Con is it's, it's about people that love stuff so much, <laughs> they, but they, they want to share it. It's like this weird thing. It's like they want to read that comic book at home, but then they want to share it with everybody at Comic-Con. And we can't do that this year, but we can we can do our best to keep on loving those things, keep on supporting the artists and authors that are making those great things and keep on putting that positivity out there. And uh, I hope that, I hope that everybody out there can embrace what they love and share what they love. And it just spreads, it spreads out there and it makes the whole world better. Mm, yeah. So awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to graphics. Um, if you're interested in checking out any of our work, please support your local indie bookstore or your local library. Thanks for joining us at Comic-Con at home. Bye.